Hello there, this is uh, Zul Morali. I'm the founding director of the Brain and Mind Institute. Uh, this is a, a, a new institute that has been formulated at the Aga Khan University. And it has uh, two uh, sites. One is in Nairobi, Kenya, and one is in Karachi, Pakistan. Uh, so we serve East Africa and South and Central Asia. Uh, the focus of the new institute is, is on actual mental health and neuroscience. And we have four pil pillars of activity. We look at, we do research, education, uh, work on innovative approaches and uh, work through partnerships. So we are actually creating a big tent uh, for people to collaborate. So that's a bit about the Institute. Wanted to welcome you on today's webinar um, that is focused on how does your brain deal with stress? Or in other words, everything you wanted to know about stress, but were afraid to ask. So for that, we have, we're very proud and honored to have an old friend and colleague of mine, Dr. Sonia Lupier, who has joined us today uh, as a keynote speaker. And then there'll be panelists that you'll be introduced to a bit later on. But Dr. Lupier is probably one of the most uh, well-recognized stress researchers and a mentor and a, a public awareness, awareness raiser uh, in Ottawa. <clears throat> she uh, holds a Canada research chair uh, in human stress, and she has been the um, founding director of Center for Studies on Human Stress in Montreal. She's a professor at the University of Montreal and uh, has been doing research in this area for well over 20 years. Uh, she's got millions of dollars in grants, she is, and she has done some very seminal studies that have, has informed the field of stress uh, in a very uh, dynamic way. <clears throat> I must also say that she's been uh, a mentor to many, many, many young researchers and scientists who are interested in the area of stress. She's been uh, a powerhouse really in Montreal in, in mobilizing the communities and increasing awareness uh, of, of stress and stress research and, and coping strategies. So, um, Without further ado, uh, I think uh, I would like to welcome here uh, today. She'll be speaking to you and then we'll engage in a bit of a panel discussion. So without further ado, Dr. Lupien, welcome. So thank you so much, Joel. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. I'm going to share my screen uh, just before. I just want to say hi. It's morning for me in Montreal, afternoon for you. I just want to take the next 30 minutes to very fast beware. I will speak fast in English, try me in French now. And uh, just to summarize to you the basic of human stress research, uh, hoping to talk to you about stress in ways that you may not have heard before. So let's start right away with uh, the this and this and this and this. And now we should be fine. Let me just put this like that. Uh, just a few minutes so that everything is set up. Okay, how can how does the, the brain deal with stress? Let's start right away with a definition. And I know it can sound very academic to start with a definition, but it's very important. Why? And I think we will allude to that later in the panel. Because very early in the process of working and, and studying human stress, many scientists around the, the, the world, we realized that hmm, maybe that. The, the, the definition that the public has of stress may not be the one we're using in the lab. And we thought that this was very important because think about it, if you don't have the right definition of stress, well, it's gonna be difficult for you to deal with stress. So we decided to do surveys all across the world. And in Canada, I did a couple of surveys. Let's say I, I asked two questions to the people. The first question, do you know what stress is? And when I do this, everyone says, yes. I said, fine, then what is it? And when I ask people what is stress for them, most of the time people will say it's time pressure. We feel stress when we don't have the time to do everything we would like to do in the allocated period of time. And this is why in the job you have already or in any other job you had in the past, if you have a consultant expert on stress coming to you and using this definition of stress as being time pressure, they will solve your problem in two seconds. They will say, since stress is time pressure, we will manage time, uh, the famous time management. And then you will end up with a very organized agenda with post-it every color everywhere. 
And after two weeks, you're gonna stop this because it's too stressful. So the first myth I wanna destroy forever this morning, it's this one. Stress is not time pressure. If it was, how can you explain that you're stressed out when you're going to the dentist? There's no, there's no time pressure. It's not the, te the technician who's going to throw you on the chair. Or how can you explain that we have been so stressed out by the pandemics when we had more time than ever because we were not stuck in traffic? So very early with this kind of surveys, we scientists working on human stress realized two things. The first, it's time for us to talk. And second, in our own research, we could never use just questionnaires to ask people if they're stressed out. There's no two people having the same definition. So we needed a measure that would never lie. That even if you're telling me, Sonia, I'm not stressed at all, but in fact you are, I will know it. And this measure, we got it in the biological response to stress. And in the next four minutes, I will give teach you your biology 101 class on stress. It will not hurt. And with this beautiful information, I'll try to explain very fast what is stress in science of stress. So how does this beautiful biological stress response works? First, the first thing you need to know, and it's very important, is the following. Your brain, and I will show you that stress starts in the brain and ends up there. Your brain is the detector of threatening information. That's the job of your brain. As I always say, your brain was not created to fill up form 111 on the corner of a desk. It will do so until there's a threat in the environment. The moment there's a threat in the environment, never will your brain allow you to continue to fill up form 111. All your attention will go on the threat in order to allow you to do the only two things you want to do if you want to survive, you fight or you get away. This you all learned in college. I will continue the story. So here is how this beautiful stress response works. Each time your brain detects a threat that we call a stress, so stress equals threat, each time your brain detects a threat, it will produce, stress horm uh, it will produce hormones, the name is not important, that will go and activate two small glands located on top of your kidneys that we call the adrenal glands. When the adrenal gland receives the message, boom, they will produce stress hormones, the name is not important, that will allow you to do the only two things you want to do if you want to survive, you fight or you get away. Let me continue the story now. In both cases, whether you decide to fight, <clears throat> sorry, to fight or to get away, you need only one thing, energy. And it is these stress hormones that gave you the energy in prehistorical times to either kill the mammoth, eat it and survive, or get away if it was too big. And here we are surviving to the mammoth. So never let anyone tell you that stress is negative, wrong. Each time the stress response is acute, bam, it is necessary for survival. So this is what we are measuring in stress lab all around the world. We are measuring these stress hormones in many, many types of biospecimen, blood, saliva, hair, perspiration, nails. We pick up everything we can, basically, and we're measuring these stress hormones. Now, this was interesting by itself, but not that much for me. For me, the story began, and began to be very interesting about 30 years later when scientists found a second thing. They found that the same stress hormones that you're producing in order to have enough energy to kill your mammoth or get away if it's too big, within a period of 10 minutes, this is fast, these stress hormones will go back to the brain. We never thought they would go back to the brain, but they do. And so research found that when they go back to the brain, they have an interesting preference for the brain regions who are involved in learning and memory and in emotional regulation, which is our capacity to control our emotion. And this is how we started to understand how chronic stress can lead to disorders like anxiety, depression, burnout, can be associated, it's not the causal factor, can be associated with the development of these uh, mental health disorder. Because remember, each time you have a mammoth in your life, you're producing stress hormones. Each time you're producing stress hormones, they go back to your brain. And what will happen is that if you have too many stressors in your life, by going back to your brain, day after day after day, these stress hormones will slowly but surely modify the way that you will interpret the next situation so that slowly but surely the glass will become we become half empty instead of half full. And this is how you will end up with these mental health disorders. So we know 
the pathway by which chronic stress can lead to these disorders. And this is, was an amazing discovery. But for me, this was not the most important question to which scientists had to provide an answer. No, the most important question was this one. Why are we so stressed out these days? Because I don't know if you realize there's no more mammoth, but yet we are very stressed out. The answer to this is very simple. It is as if our brain is a bit stupid. It doesn't make the difference yet between an absolute and a relative stressor. We think that one day the brain will pick up that we are in 2022 and make the difference, but so far it doesn't. So what are these two types of stressor? Well, an absolute stressor is a real threat to your survival. For example, someone comes into my room and shouts, fire! I'm not going to start talking to Zul about you know, whether I should leave or not. Within two seconds, I'm out and you just have my bookshelves to look in the background. We don't have a lot of absolute stressor nowadays. We are mostly surrounded by relative stressor. But before summarizing to you what is a relative stressor, let me just show you what is an absolute stressor? You know, I've been wanting forever in my lab to bring people and expose them to an absolute stressor. And I cannot do this because the ethic committee will never allow me to do this. But what's it, what is interesting is that in Brazil, there is a very popular show. And I guess they don't have the same ethic committees as we do because they can do this in Brazil. They have a very popular show where the main goal of the show is to take someone who doesn't know what's going to happen to them, didn't sign any consent form. And then they are going to expose them to something very, very stressful and fearful. And they will film this and show this to the public. I love my new Brazilian friends because they provide me with videos of absolute stressor. And I can now show you today was it, what is an absolute stressor so that sitting on your chair, you can ask yourself, do I really look like this when I say that I'm very stressed out? So what you will see is two ladies, they are in an elevator in Brazil, they're going to shop. And exactly, they have no idea what's going to happen to them. They didn't sign any consent form. And then the elevator will stop. Mammoth number one. Lights will go off. Mammoth number two. And while the lights are off, a, a little door will open uh, in the elevator. And out of this door will come a young girl disguised as the exorcise. And then the lights will go on. Now, when the lights go on, I want you to look at the face of the ladies. This is what is an absolute stressor. So what you see here, my friend, is called the freeze response. And the lady totally froze in front of the stressor. And many, many times people will ask me, why, Sonia, don't you ever talk about the freeze response as being a stress response? Well, because it's not a stress response. It's, it's a trauma response. Think about it. If we had all frozen in front of mammoths in prehistorical time, they would have eaten all us alive. So when you have someone in front of you with a freeze response, it means that this person is at the frontier between a stress and a trauma. So obviously we don't look like that today. Today we are surrounded by a relative stressor. And this is one of the most important, I think, discovery of human stress research. Scientists found that there are four characteristics of a situation that will induce a stress response, whoever you are, wherever you are, whatever your age, whatever your job. I challenge you, to find a situation in your life that you find stressful and that you cannot explain by at least one of these four characteristics, you will not be able to do this. Let's make a little test, you and I. Close your eyes. You can do this here at home. And I will give you five seconds to reactivate a stressor of your week. And then I will explain it. Five seconds. You should have found one. I'm going to explain your stressor. What you need to understand is that the situation doesn't need to have all four characteristics in order to induce a stress response. The more you have, the worse it is. And if there is only one thing you want to remember from this conference today, this is it. And I will give you an acronym to remember it. And if you are a parent, let me tell you a second thing. Your brain doesn't know how old you are. It doesn't care. So whether you're five years of age, 17, 42, or 71, it is the same four characteristics that will induce a stress response. So is, here is the stress recipe. Think about your stressor now and put a little chick chick if it's there. So in order for a situation to induce a stress response, it has to be novel. 
It has to be unpredicted or unpredictable. It must be threatening to your ego or if you prefer to your personality. For example, someone questioning your capacity to do your job at the coffee machine on a Tuesday morning in front of colleagues, <laughs> the little feeling you have going back to your desk, this is called a stress response. And most importantly, you must have the feeling you don't have control over the situation. I can assure you that each time your brain is exposed to one of these four characteristics, bam, you will produce a stress response. In order for you to remember this, remember stress don't go nuts, novelty, unpredictability, threat to your ego and sense of low control. When I say this to people, they say, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. makes sense, Sonia. But I have difficulty visualizing someone that could be stressed out because of the nuts characteristics. So I went back to Google and I found a short video that's gonna show you what it means to be stressed out by the nuts characteristics. So what you will see in this next video is two men working in an open space area, which is very dangerous to have your ego threatened, I'm right? And one of the men think it's too hot in the room and the other men think it's too cold. So the first one will try to decrease the heat and the other one will try to increase it. Let's see what happens. And when I show you this video, most of you will say, no, Sonia, I understand, but I'm not like this. I'm not going to jump on my colleague. Come on. And I believe you. I totally believe you. But, 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 you had a very, very stressful day. You come back home and you find yourself shouting at your child because he drops something on the table when in fact you don't want to shout. Why? Because the first sign that these stress hormones are playing in your head is what we call spontaneous anger. When you get very upset like this, it's a sign that stress is getting into your brain. So let me answer the question you had in your mind since the beginning of this conference, Sonia, how do I fight stress? Well, the best answer to this is this one, by not fighting it. Why? Because I told you the stress response is necessary for survival. So if you fight stress, you fight yourself. This is not the way to deal with the, the thing. The best way to deal with the thing is to understand why stress is there and how we can deal with it. One of the best way to decrease a stress response is to, that's it, is to use your body. And I love this part of my conference because when I give a conference to people in the same room and I can see their eyes and I show them how to use their body to stop the stress response, I always see some deception in their eyes, as if they figured that after 30 years of research, I should come up with something more complicated than laughing to decrease stress response. And this is the problem. Two things I want to tell you on this. The first one, most parents think that most parents are very stressed out by the stress of their children. But what you have to realize is that children are much better than we are to decrease a stress response by themselves. You know why? Because they do some things we don't since we are adults. They're following their intuition. The brain knows what it needs to stop a stress response. Think about it. We survived mammoth. And that's the problem. The second thing I want to tell you, that's the problem I see with adults. Most adults will try to find outside of them ways to decrease their stress response when in fact they have everything they need inside of them to stop it. So they will be ready to pay $2,000 for a workshop and de-stress during a weekend that will propose something very complicated. For example, utilization of an electrical table with peanut butter. I'm saying anything and it won't work. And then two weeks later, they're gonna pay another $2,000 for another workshop and de-stress that will propose something very complicated, won't work. And they will end up in a fetal position on the floor of the kitchen saying there's nothing to do in PIM when in fact, since the beginning, they had everything they needed inside of them to stop the stress response. Think about it. There were no gurus at $2,000 on the weekend in, time of, in, the, in the time of mammoth, and yet they survived things much more heavy 
than what we have today. So if we have survived, it's because it is simple. Think about it. If you need a life coach to de-stress, what happens if your life coach is not available? Survival of the species is at stake. It cannot work this way. So what you need to understand is that the best way to survive to anything in terms of stress is to be able to stop the stress response alone, naked, in the woods. If you cannot do this, you're dead. And this is why the body is the best tool to stop the stress response. So I cannot propose something complicated. I have too much respect for the people who pay my research with their income taxes. So I'm going to give you three ways to use your body. Very simple, stopping the stress response. There are many others that you can find on the web as well. So the first is belly breathing. You know what I call belly breathing. I'm going to give you your short class 101 on belly breathing because sometimes people do this all wrong and they pass out because they hyperventilate. I don't want this to happen. So this is your belly 101 class. Each time you put air in your body, you have to push the belly as much as you, as you can, like a balloon. Pwit, 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 pwit. And when you push the belly, push the belly. Don't stop doing the things like that. Why? Because under your thoracic cage, you have a muscle that is called the diaphragm. The biggest belly you do, the more you put the extension on this muscle, and at a certain level of extension, boom, you stop the stress response. Simple as that. Another way to do belly breathing without realizing it, sing. When we sing, we decrease stress hormones by about 10%. There is no guru at $2,000 a weekend that can decrease your stress hormones by 0.0005%. And it's free. <laughs> Second way, you need to get rid of the mobilized energy. I told you when we stress, we mobilize energy. Well, you have to lose this energy. If not, it's going to go play in your head. People think you have to go to the gym for two hours to lose the energy. Never said that. 15 minutes will do the job. That's why I have a dog that I walked for twice a day. So most people will say, okay, well, what happens? What, what do you do when your dog, is, well, you know, what they, when it's training outside, for example, well, I'm going to use everything that nature gave me. The number of times in my life that I distress my kid by having them dance. What do you think that mammoth hunter were doing at night around the fire? They were dancing. What were they doing while dancing? They were getting rid of the mobilized energy during the hunt. So try this and don't tell me it doesn't work until you try. Promise? After this conference, take yourself and create a playlist of the best disco sound ever. And the next time you will be stressed, put everyone outside of your room, put this on shuffle and go. And before telling me it doesn't work, try. Last one, laugh. Many people will say it's time of stress, not time to laugh, wrong. It is when you are stressed out, you have to laugh. Why? Because when you laugh, you send the message to your brain that it's not a mammoth. You cannot kill a mammoth while laughing, right? So it is as if when you laugh, the brain would say, that, calm down, it's not a mammoth, she's laughing. In contrast, if you come to work every day upset against everyone, the brain will say, God, a threat, and it will produce stress hormones and you're gonna kill yourself alone in your office. Once this is using your body to stop the stress response, I'll, I, before getting, uh, finishing my conference, I will show you another way to stop a stress response. Children love doing this, by the way, try this with your family. It's called deconstructing and reconstructing the stressful situation. You have to understand why you are stressed out and what, when you understand, then you have all the tools to stop the stress response. So what you see on the screen is what we call a deconstruction table. You can find this on the web very easily. Print it. Put it on your fridge, fill it up for seven to 10 days. And while you're there, print one for your husband, put it on the fridge so that he can do this as well. And print one for each one of your children and have fun filling this up as a family. You will learn a lot of things. I'll show you. How do we fill this thing? Well, on the left uh, uh, column, you can put all the stressful situation for seven to 10 days. And then you have the nuts characteristics. And the game is to put an X under the characteristics that um, defines your stressor. For example, you could say, well, I had a fight with my spouse this morning. That's my stressor. And it was stressful because it was novel and I didn't have control over the situation. You put your X. And then you could say the pandemic, the COVID is stressful because it's novel, unpredictable, threatening to my personality, and I don't have feeling I have control. And then my sick child is very stressful because I don't know if it's COVID, so it's novel, unpredictable, and I don't have control over the situation. So once you have filled up uh, for a week, you will find out that there's always one characteristics or two sometimes, but most of the time it's only one that is most often filled out. This is the characteristic to which you are particularly sensitive. And if you had fun filling this out as a family, you will realize that you, it's novelty that stresses you. 
Your husband is on predictability and your child, child for example, is threat to the ego. Do you have any idea what you just realized? And most of the time people will say, no, I don't, re I don't realize, I don't know what I realize. Well, my God, the number of times by, you know, I have deconstructed my stress and that of my children. And I realized that me, it's unpredictability who stresses me. My daughter is sense of control and my son is threat to the ego. Now, if I know that my son is particularly sensitive to threat to the ego, will I really give him a comment on his new hairstyle cut uh, in front of his friend? No, because I know that this is what will be his triggering factor for stress. So when you do this, you decrease a lot of the familial conflict because you know exactly to which type of characteristics each member of your family is particularly sensitive. Now, let's continue. If your husband, for example, had filled up the, the reconstruction, the deconstruction table, you would also have written fight with the spouse. He was there. And then you could realize that you will not put the X at the same place. No, for him, it was stressful because it was unpredictable and threatening to, the, to his ego. And this is when you, really, you will realize that the same situation can stress two people for very, very different reasons. Do you understand what you just realized? And once again, people will say, uh, no, no. The number of times I hear parents say to their children, for example, God, why are you stressed out by this? Come on, I'm okay with this. You should be okay. You cannot decide for someone else what is stressful for them. Why? Because what is novel for him cannot be for you. What is unpredictable for her cannot be for you. And what you control, they may not be able to control. And when you understand this, you understand why people around you are so stressed out. Once you have deconstructed your stressor, you will reconstruct it. The reverse, the reverse word for stress is not relaxation. It's not because you're going to a spa during the weekend that the lady at the coffee machine threatening your ego will be gone. She's still there. The reverse word for stress is resilience. And resilience is the capacity to have a plan B, C, D. Here's the game. You have to find a plan in your, you have to look for a plan in your head until you think it would work. Let me give you an example. I realized that the fight, the fight with my spouse was stressful because I didn't have control over the situation. So I will reconstruct my stressor by asking myself, what should I do to have the feeling I have more control over my, uh, my, my fight, the fight with my spouse? Plan B, I divorce. Is this what I want? No, but you want a plan C. Okay, plan C, I'm going to talk to my husband about it. Do I think it's going to work? Nah, he will not listen to me. He's too stressed out these days. But you need a plan D. Plan D, oh, I'm going to write him a letter. Yes, I think this is going to work. Fine, stop it there right now. Here is the important information. 95% of people will never put into action the plan that would work. I don't care. Because we found that the next time you have your stressor, the mere fact of reactivating the plan that would work gives the message to your brain you have control. This is all the brain needs to stop producing the stress response. So never go in front of a stressor without a plan B. It is the equivalent of trying to chase a mammoth without a spear. So this is a very, very uh, powerful technique. Children love doing this. So this is what I wanted to tell you. And just for you to have more information on this, as Zulu was saying, we do a lot of knowledge transfer in my lab because I think that we are working on something that is so important for the public that we have to do this and create everything we can to inform you of everything we find when we find it. So the Center for Studies on Human Stress is a website, you have the address, it's created for the public. Everything that is written in there, you can understand it's written for the public. And then you have, you can, on this website, you can find blog posts on many, many issues. And we have our official magazine that is the Mammoth Magazine. We have many, it's free, many, we have about 25 issues. So if you read this, you know everything about stress. And these are the, this is the book I wrote many years ago in French, Par Amour du Stress, which is summarizing the entire field of human stress research for the public. It's a very popular book in Canada. And this book is being translated right now as we speak. The, the translation in English should be done by September, October. So you will have this yellow uh, cover for the love of stress. And it should be available uh, on the editor website in a PDF format for people all across the world because it's very dis difficult to distribute book across the world. So the best way is to have a PDF, or you can order it as well on my webpage, uh, I guess, uh, in October uh, next year. So this is what I had to tell you. Looking forward for the discussion. I will stop my share. And uh, here it is. Thank you, Dr. Lupien. This was really 
very exciting and and you had me at the edge of my seat all the time so <laughs> like you always do um talking about a very stressful topic but in a way that's really quite empowering and and okay. educating so thank you um Kendi, over to you. I agree, uh, Dr. Lupia, that was super amazing. And um, I've, I've taken notes. My key note is I'll go nuts when I'm stressed, just so okay. that I can be able to manage my stress levels. Um, so um, just before we get into the panel session and to keep the session as interactive as Dr. Lupia began, um, I'll ask uh, all of us as participants to move to the next, to engage with us by answering two questions. If you can, you can use www.menti.com and enter the code that's written there, or you can scan the QR code so that we can be able to hear your responses to two questions. So we'll give you about a minute or two, and then uh, please share your thoughts. We'll see your thoughts on the screen as you share them in a few minutes, and then we'll move on into the panel discussion. So um, guys, um, please go ahead. Please keep your comments coming in. Uh, as I said, um, we've set up our menti such that you're able to navigate to and fro at your own pace. Um, now it's my distinct pleasure to also introduce the panel members that will be sharing um, their thoughts on several other matters around stress. Um, and of course, uh, Dr. Lupia will join us in the panel session. Uh, you've heard all about her great work around stress. Um, our next panel member is Dr. Edna Bosire, who is a medical anthropologist with the Brain and Mind Institute at the Aga Khan University. Um, and her research interests are in health systems, strengthening in Africa, HIV, AIDS, diabetes, mental health, and nutrition. Um, we also have Dr. Manasi Kumar, who is a senior implementation scientist and mental health consultant, uh, whose key interests include the strengthening of mental health research capacity in um, sub-Saharan Africa and other emerging economies, as well as in the building of sustainable and equitable partnerships that inform progress in global mental health. Um, last but definitely not least is our very own Dr. Hadia Pasha, who's an Associate Director, uh, Counseling Services and Wellness at the Aga Khan University with 25 years of experience practicing and teaching mental health and has pioneered programs for psychotherapeutic counseling and emotional wellness for university students and medical trainees. So I'd really like to welcome you all to this session. Um, before we begin though, um, just in keeping with uh, the pace that Dr. Lupien um, set, I want to teach us uh, some Kenyanese. And when I say Kenyanese, that is uh, how we uh, spoil the English language or even our own languages and come up with our own unique ways of interpreting language. So um, there's this really popular song right now in Kenya and uh, the key words are mi sipangwingwi. So if you can see uh, the word up here, I'm trying to highlight it, mi sipangwingwi. The direct translation of that is me, I cannot be managed, uh, which is really interesting. But the actual meaning is that nobody tells me what to do or no one can tell me what to do. And we're moving into uh, the next session, which is talking about culture and stress. And really what stands out to me, uh, circling back to that uh, subject matter, how does your brain or my brain deal with stress? Are we really fully in control of how we respond to and cope with stress? Or does our culture or how we have been encultured influence how we respond to or cope uh, with stress? And so um, I'll invite Edna and Hadia to respond to this question, but I'll first ask them to start off by sharing in their own words what stress is and how stress is perceived and then they can take us back to the influences of, on, of culture on stress, if that actually happens. Um, welcome, um, Hadia and Edna. 
Thank you very much, Kendi, and thank you very much, Lucien, for setting a very uh, good background on the issue of stress. And I like that now we are moving to the uh, aspect of culture because uh, much of uh, what we understand is uh, individual agency of taking care of or trying to control or manage stress, but also culture has a role to play. Societies, we come from societies or communities. So uh, in my own understanding, I, I really, this is a difficult question for me to say I have a particular word to describe or to explain stress. As an anthropologist, it's very difficult to narrow down the, the word stress to fit different communities because people have different ways that they talk about stress or express stress. And uh, a, a lot of definition of stress really resonates with the Western kind of framing of the word stress or even some of the psychometric uh, skills that are used to measure stress, which might not apply across different uh, countries or cultures. I've had an opportunity to work in South Africa, uh, Kenya, Tanzania, currently based in Malawi. And uh, we have people uh, explaining stress using various words. In a nutshell, uh, I see stress as suffering. I can say uh, people talk about suffering. They don't have a specific word to say, this is how we describe stress but suffering, be it individual, be it environmental related stressors. And when it comes to the issue of culture, culture is very important because it shapes how we define stress, how we understand stress. And it actually provides an, a, an appraisal system that people or individuals within that kind of structural setting are able to identify whether a particular event is stressful, is neutral, or is less stressful. For example, in Africa, we have a lot of initiation rites, like ritual circumcisions, where boys are initiated into adulthood. And some of these traditional practices might be quite stressful, but the way those communities might perceive this might be less stressful. So that is one way that stress is perceived across cultures or not perceived as a threat across cultures. And another thing is that then a culture also determines how we express our stress. For example, in, in Kenya, an example is that uh, men most men are really traditionally are not expected to cry whenever they, they feel they are stressed or depressed you know but uh things are changing now but it's actually the culture that shapes how we express our afflictions how we express our suffering and so on and so forth i'll just stop there to allow my colleague to also contribute and then we can continue thank you Thank you very much, uh, Edna. So I feel that uh, a lot has been said about what stress is, uh, but I would just try to um, sort of reiterate what has been said. So stress is basically a, a state where you feel strained because something may be overwhelming. You may think of it as a threat to your well-being or simply as something that is challenging and you feel you need to do something about it. So um, culturally, I in Pakistan, we have a very diverse culture. And I have seen people taking stress as something which is outside in the environment, uh, very much uh, like there. I'm stressed because of this. Um, many times, when they refer to stress, they are talking about things that are uncontrollable. And it sort of gives that feeling of helplessness that need not be there. You know, so many times uh, we are dealing with stress, by the way, all the time in our life. Simple commuting to one place to another, you know, meeting a deadline, doing stuff in our life. It's all stressful, but we are very used to it. And uh, we gen generally do not refer to it while we are talking to people. But when we talk about stress, we talk about things that we feel we have been unable to deal with. So when we people start talking about stress, it's like I'm subjected to just like um, Dr. Edna said, some suffering, which may not be suffering. I would also say that in some cultures, it is not very acceptable to express feeling of weakness. So many times their expression of stress in some cultures is very physiological. When they are stressed, it's difficult for them to say that I'm feeling tense. They would rather say, I have a headache. They would rather say I have you know, a pain in my chest. So I think culture not only determines what is normal to experience, 
you know culture determines how how okay it is to feel stressed and what should you do when you feel stress so there's one thing the experience the subjective experience of stress but there's another thing the metacognition how do you feel about feeling stressed culture also determines that so if your culture does not appreciate someone who looks buried who looks stressed you will self stigmatize you would not feel very happy because you are stressed and then rather than coping with stress you'll keep on worrying about why am i feeling this way and this is what i have noticed working with so many people rather than the actual thing they would worry about why am i not strong enough why am i not able to handle like other people can and there's another thing that i would like to put forward at this point in time is many times people confuse predictability with controllability so things may happen which were not in your control but that does not mean you cannot do anything to change the situation so when we talk about controllability we have to be very clear that we do not confuse it with predictability and second we should not aim for absolute control many times you know you can influence things you can bring about some change although you may not be able to absolutely control the outcome so these are the things that are very much determined by the culture you know um, telling people you should be able to do this pull up your socks why can't you do this why are you feeling stressed about it so say so they start feeling ashamed about their own stress and and sorry taking uh, some time last but not the least the language so some languages use the same words for stress or mood that they use for mental health so if someone is sad or depressed and depression is a disorder people may not feel very comfortable talking about feeling depressed so language the way it shapes our thoughts the language the way it makes us realize things language the way normalcy is set in the culture it all plays its part thank you thanks dr pasha and now just open it up uh, go right ahead dr lupia well i two things uh, dr pasha you are absolutely right this is why what we have shown so far is sense of having low control it's not control my daughter was stressed out at 5 years of age to start school like and not tell her that she can quit school at 5 i had to give her the feeling she was control she has she was having control over the situation and this is very interesting zul i don't know if i talked to you my main goal in life was to do a you know around the world definition of stress so this is so important for me listening to you uh, about it and i think we should do something like that and getting all together on a virtual thing Uh, Zul knows everyone around the world and create a book or something about the definition of stress. I'm not joking; it's very important because it brings me just one thing that has been showing up in science. Uh, stress science is called stress mindset. So check this out, and I think you're going to be very interesting in that. So people have mostly negative stress mindset. So most people will say that stress is negative, toxic, etc. And this is because of scientists, because Zul will know it doesn't look good as scientists to study positive things. It's too esoteric. So we need to solve problems. So we always study negative things. If not, we don't have grants. And since we have just measured the negative effects of stress, this is what media picked up. and put into facebook and social media etc so stress is always seen as being toxic negative etc but yet in 1997 i showed the presence of an inverted u shaped function between stress and well-being and even performance a little bit of stress is good and then it goes uh, very uh, negative and studies have shown they brought people in the lab who had negative stress mindset or positive stress mindset knowing that it's positive and they found that those who have negative stress mindset produce more stress hormones do i have 2 minutes to just give you one of the best study ever done by my colleague in the us dr jeremy jamison try this if you're a teacher it's amazing he did a study if you don't believe stress mindset after this and, and uh, dr uh, dr bazir it's exactly what you were saying he took 10 year old children brought them to the lab stressed them and measured their performance 
And again, there's an inverted U shape between stress and performance. Split the group in two. First half, I said to the children, bon, now I'm going to stress you. And in order for you to recognize the stress response, well, the stress response is, you know, the little nod, the big nod you have in your stomach, this is stress. So he stressed the kids and measured their memory. To the other group of kids, he said, bon, I'm going to stress you. And in order for you to recognize the stress or, well, the, the, the stress feeling is, you know, the little butterflies that you have in your stomach, that's stress. And then he measured their, he stressed them, measured their performance. And he showed that when you say to children that it was little butterfly, the stress response, so changing the mindset, they produce just enough stress hormones to increase their memory. And when you tell them it's a nod and it's very bad, it, they produce too much stress hormones and it decreases their memory. This is the best study ever saw that I ever saw on the power of the definition. So the definition you have a stress as being totally toxic is going to kill you because this is what you read all your life. This is going to stress you. It's so powerful. This is why now in my lab, we have started to change the mindset and we're teaching children and, and, and teacher the positive effects of stress. Stress increases strength, physical strength by sevenfold. And I will finish with this. There's a beautiful picture, but not a beautiful, but an amazing picture of Ukraine where you see this young woman, she's all small and she's been walking 17 kilometers with her a German shepherd, which is a huge dog, 30 kilos on her shoulder. This woman could not do this without having an absolute stress response that will increase her physical strength by six to seven fold. So we have to change the mindset. And this is so cultural. This is why I think, uh, you know, a huge project on stress around the world with all the definition would be something very helpful. I would work with you guys anytime. Well, I think that's great. We will certainly follow up on that. And we're quite interested in that as well. So I think we can have a, a, a easily a, a global assessment. Yes, and we can do our share to help with that. Um, just, I think it's really interesting because the synergy here, um, Dr. Lupia, you just went straight into our next set of questions, which was a healthy stress versus unhealthy stress. And I was going to posit the question, um, is there uh, even anything like healthy stress? And you actually spoke to that, so that's really cool. Um, for this set of questions, I'll also ask um, um, Dr. Manasi to share with us um, her perspective on the impact of stress on our minds, our bodies, how we behave, how we relate with other people, and also speak to some of the uh, apropos coping strategies um, that people should think about to employ a healthy stress versus unhealthy stress. So I'll, I'll hand that over to you, Dr. Manasi. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Well, Dr. Lupin, that was such a brilliant, um, such a brilliant uh, talk and such wonderful uh, messages that uh, you've got. So I think I, I want to learn all my lessons about stress from Dr. Lupin's talk. She covered everything that we ought to know. This is the inverted uh, uh, curve that she's talking about that, you know, that we need a little bit of uh, a kick to get us started to kind of, uh, you know, to, to, to move us out of our slumber. We need that push, that motivation, uh, that drive that is needed. And then, uh, you know, too much of it, of course, causes distress and is everywhere in our life. There is a little bit of a sweet spot that we want to kind of reach where optimal performance can be had, we can be creative, we can be energized. And I think that example of how to rephrase perception of stress or how it feels, experience of stress for kids is so illuminating that perhaps even thinking about viewing the situation differently is, is one way of trying to have a healthy response to stress. I think I want us to internalize the three messages uh, and the importance of nuts that uh, Dr. Lupian talked about. So I'm not going to mull about uh, uh, with regards to that and the three uh, techniques that she, she shared with us. But all I want to perhaps add here is that, that as part of uh, a management, uh, a, a cohesive response to managing, to dealing with stress, perhaps organizations, teams, families, uh, uh, countries, cities need to start thinking about ways in which resilience can be promoted. And I think we need to have um, a culture where uh, there is uh, a promotion of psychosocial support, uh, social and healthy activities can be nudged 
uh, some kind of mentorship, particularly within organizational settings, work settings, that is so much of source of stress, and then intellectual stimulation of the right kind so that there, there aren't people aren't reacting out of a lot of uh, boredom and lack of, uh, you know, feeling synergized about things. And I think for have, in order to have healthy stress, uh, we need to have mental health friendly uh, kind of work environment, cities and contexts where resilience is promoted, the right kind of values are promoted. We also need to have insightful, I, I think the kind of strategies around not, uh, you know, I will certainly try that out. It, it allows us to, and I think what you also showed us was how to interpret what these findings are, which we don't always do with these kind of tools. So gathering insight and then learning key self-care uh, kind of strategies uh, would be very, very important, the kinds that you've all listed here. So I think those are, those are, my, um, those are the things I would like to contribute to this uh, really illuminating uh, discussion. So thanks, Candy. Dr. Lupia, please go right ahead and then we'll open it up to the panel to just share a little bit more about healthy versus unhealthy stress and its impact. Well, I think I'm going to share with you as an add-on to this results of a study. It's not published yet, but it has been accepted for publication, so I can share it because it has been reviewed by my peers. And I think it's one of the weirdest <laughs> study I ever done, but one of the most interesting. And it goes with what Edna was talking about, the, the fact when, when she asked herself, and she's absolutely right on this one, and this, one, this is why I did the study, when people say that they are stressed out, what do they say exactly? I mean, are they really talking about stress? Because, you know, 75% of visits to doctors, it's for stress. What are they talking about? So what I've decided to do, we know that the stress hormones, for example, glucocorticoids are stress hormones. Why? Because you bring someone to the lab, you stress them and it increases. You can do this in a rat, you can do this in any kind of animal. So this is a hormone that responds to stress. So it's a biomarker of stress. We can also measure stress by questionnaires, anxiety, depressions, uh, chronic stress, etc. So I decided to do a study, say, well, when people say they are stressed, are they really stressed? Meaning, do they have high level of of cortisol or stress hormones or or what are they talking about? So I decided I put two ads in the, out there, not at the same time, but in the same place. The first ad was, are you very, very stressed out? If so, call us. We, we do a study. So we put the ad. Many, many people called us. We recruited them. A couple of weeks later, we've put another ad to the same place. Are you Zen? Because we needed a very low stress group. So the best is Zen. Are you very Zen? Please call us. I was sure that no one would call. Actually, we had as many people. And it was very much fun because one day I was walking in the corridor of my lab where we have the testing room. And I, I was walking and I looked through the window and I saw someone in a lotus position sitting on a desk. And I said, well, that's, that must be part of the Zen group. <laughs> it was funny. So we had a lot of Zen people. And in both groups, we measured depression, anxiety, uh, perceived stress. We measure stress hormones at home. So when they're at home, are they producing to, because they have a lot of conflict? And we expose them to a stressor in the lab. And we measured stress hormones. So we did all this. And the results, which are very interesting, we found that systematically, those who say that they are very, very stressed out, they score higher on depression. They score higher on anxiety. They score significantly higher on, on perceived stress. But there's no difference at all on biomarkers of stress. Those who are very stressed out score very poorly as well on capacity for emotional regulation. They don't know what to do with these emotions. So the conclusion of this study is that when people say to you that they are stressed, they're not talking about stress, at least the way we have been studying it in the lab. I think what they're referring to, and I think Anna is totally right, is suffering. What I called in the paper, psychological distress. And I think we are going to start, this is why this, this project around the world is so important. We are going to have start helping people to put words on the right emotions. But, you know, when you say hassles, stress, anxiety, it's all the same for people. And in my public conference, this is always the question I have. What's the difference between stress and anxiety? What's so I think we're going to need to start providing them with a lexicon of what we mean. But actually, this study showed me that when people say that they are stressed out, 
this is not the stress that we're measuring in the lab that we know that is related to everything I, I have said so far. So I think that that is also very interesting. And, it, and again, as Anna was saying, this may change as a function of the culture in which we, we, we live, etc. So there's a lot of work to do on this. Sonia, so I have a question for you. What happened to the people who signed up as Zen group? How were they different in terms of uh, their rating scales? And there. Oh, when I say there was a significant difference, it was between the very stressed out and the Zen. Oh, okay, got you. So, they, so the Zen, no, the Zen, they had they scored higher on resilience, etc. And when the pandemic came, I followed them. I picked up the study and followed them. They're uh -huh. still doing perfectly fine. They're very good with emotional regulation. I don't know where they learned it, but they're very good. I see. That's very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Lupien and uh, the previous speakers who've just spoken. I just wanted to point out that we've also done uh, quite a lot of systematic reviews in sub-Saharan Africa to try and understand then the different idioms that people use to express their distress. And uh, there's this blanket word of like thinking too much, but then people have uh, different cultural uh, languages that they use to express what they mean by thinking too much. Like uh, in Kenya, for example, a study we did, then people have different Swahili words. For example, uh, kufikiria sana, which sometimes is uh, closely linked to huzuni, which actually based in Kenyan setting, huzuni is something that goes towards depression. But uh, other studies in South Africa, uh, in Zimbabwe, for example, thinking too much in Malawi. And uh, the thing that is coming out is that what, how people express their emotions, they also link to different body pains. And I think Dr. Pasha mm -hmm. had mentioned about that. Some people might link it to the heart, to their shoulders, to their mind. So there's a lot of connection between our mind and heart. And some people might say, maybe I have a crying heart, I have a heavy heart, I have very weighty shoulders. So these are very important aspects that communities are trying to use to express uh, the different uh, distress that they're experiencing. But my last comment is about then uh, moving towards the positive aspect. And I like what you just mentioned, because it, we are not in just to look for people who are distressed, but also what, are, ha what is happening in community that is positive that we could build on. Because communities or societies have resources already, they have their own ways of coping. They have different coping mechanisms, which are very mm -hmm. important that as practitioners, as researchers, we need to, to look at, out for these positive strategies that we could strengthen so that communities can continue coping. Because honestly, we won't finish all stressors that are happening in, in the world, but we can support the different coping mechanisms that are existing. And lastly, in South Africa, we've done a flourishing kind of work to see how communities are becoming resilient. And we have different ways that communities are flourishing, drawing from the social, uh, social uh, resources, the church, that is religion, uh, schools, institutions, the hospital, and even social groups at the communities. All these are very important things to, to think about even as we move forward. Thank you. So, uh, Dr. Fasha uh, Manasi, any final thoughts on that? No, lots to think about because I think um, we, we all deal with, this is a very important issue in terms of identifying what we're actually feeling and what, how we express it uh, and, and the, the relationship to the cultural support systems and um, cultural norms. Those are all very important issues in, in terms of us coping with stress. And I think in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, where we have a lot of work going on, um, stressors come mile a minute and, and, um, and we, we have to continue coping no matter what. And so the more we understand how we define things, how we cope with them, um, and what do we mean uh, exactly when we talk about stress, I think those are very critical issues that we need to find global solutions and global answers. I mean, right now they're not, not there. And like one of the areas, for example, that I was quite interested in, one of the areas that we study a lot is depression. And so when I came to Kenya and I was looking for a word for depression in Kiswahili, there was none. But does that mean that people don't get depressed? Of course they do, probably just as much, if not more. So um, just because the words are not there to capture your emotional state or your feelings doesn't mean that that's not existing there. It is just that it's being expressed in a different way. So how do we get to the bottom of it? Because that is the key, mm -hmm. fight the mammoth, yeah. So I would like 
to add something here like um, we have to give this to stress that many times um, people can use the word stress to actually refer to uh, the mental health issues that they are facing. So many times, um, you know, they find it easy to say that, you know, I cannot sleep because I'm stressed. I cannot sleep. I cannot eat because I'm stressed. I am getting very angry these days because I'm stressed rather than understanding that it's actually an underlying mental health issue now. So um, another thing that I would say is that um, in our culture, the first word uh, that was used for stress, um, pressure maybe, tension, that was it. But these days, uh, people, I would say, are able to differentiate between, um, you know, the stress that they feel recently and things that they have been feeling for a long time. This is also very important because chronic stress has its own effects on people. And now I see that people can sort of are more aware of the effects of chronic stress on them than they used to be aware of previously. However, this thing that stress makes you strong, this is something that we really need to inculcate. Mm -hmm. People really take stress as something very negative rather than as something that can actually make them more strong and more resilient. Thank you. So I, I think that Dr. Lien pointed out very early on is this issue of our systems being programmed to respond to acute stressors. And we are now in a realm where the stressors are very protracted, ongoing, one stress after another, um, maybe sometimes low-grade stressors followed by acute episodes of high stressors. So it's a different uh, environment that our body is now certainly exposed to over through the evolutionary period. And I think um, we had um, a colleague of mine, Dr. Sopolsky, who had written a book called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. And he was trying to get to the essence of, um, of this chronicity of stress and, and how um, if you are in a situation where you get acute stress and you can get away, that it's much healthier to be able to, our bodies to cope with uh, in, instead of being put in a situation where you're chronically, being exposed. And, uh, and Dr. Lupien has worked a lot with uh, Bruce McEwen talking about allostatic load, like how all these stressors kind of add on to your, your body. And at one point in time, a straw will break a camel's back. So, so yes, I think that in, in, where we are now transitioning towards talking about depression rather than stress, it probably has to do with the new environment that suddenly uh, we have evolved into. And, and so we are having to now reprogram and re rearrange how our body really reacts to these conditions. And, and we're in a learning phase. So I think these studies about understanding the impact of stressors on, on, on coping and well being are, are critically important because it's not going to go away, it's going to get worse. And so, how do we find the best tools? to enable the body to actually cope and survive and maybe even thrive in under stressful conditions. So, yeah, so I'll, I'll pass it back to Sonia because I think that she has really done a lot, a lot of work in this, in this area of understanding. I'll just finish with a personal experience. When I decided to change the stress mindset, at least for children in schools and teenagers, I started to explain to teachers the positive effects of stress. It increases vigilance. And I gave them examples for their children to share with. It increases physical strength, decreases pain. Um, and, and this sounds you know, not important, but it is extremely important. For example, I was giving them this, this example, increases vigilance. You go to a party because you're a teenager and you're supposed to sleep there. You know? And then at 3 a.m. in the morning, you realize there's no room left. So decide to go back home and you're a girl and you're walking alone on the street at 3 a.m. in the morning and everything is fine until boom, you have a stress response because you realize you're alone on the street at 3 a.m. in the morning. Boom, you are going to create this stress response that will increase your vigilance. You will become a super detector of threatening information around you. You'll take your cell phone, you know, ready to call. This is what 
you will need in, because you will not be the perfect victim if someone ever came. If someone comes, you will be ready and you will survive. So this is just a very simple example. And what I like working with teachers, they come back to us many, many times, you know, and many teachers call me back, said, Sonia, not for all the children and the teenagers, but for some of them, first, they did not believe it. Because, you know, these kids, since they were born, they're 14 years old. When you read Facebook, etc., this is all they read about the negative effects of stress, etc. And she said, for most of them, they first did not believe us when we said them, told them that. And for some of them, it was a game changer. You know, it was really a game changer. And I showed them how to teach children. The next time you're in front of an exam and you're freaking out, just tell your brain three times this sentence. This is not a stress. It's a challenge. Because the power of the mind on the stress response is strong. This is not a stress, the right hand side of the curve that uh, you were showing. This is a challenge. And you will see it's going to open up a little bit and the brain will just calm down a bit and you will be at the top of your performance. And they told me that for some of the kids with whom they are working, it was a really game changer and it really changed the way that they were seeing things. So it has positives. We have to show them they are perfectly they are amazing mammoth hunter or whatever we were doing in prehistorical time and we we don't want to forget this because this is what the stress response is at the beginning yeah so um i think we should also uh, point this out um, use this um, session as an opportunity to help the participants understand that everyone's reaction to a stress a stressful situation is different and uh, many times we unfairly compare ourselves to others or, um, you know, sort of feel that why are we unable to um, handle things that other can. So there are some things that mediate our reactions to stress. The people um, have different coping resources, financial resources, health, past, uh, support systems, and all this affects the way they respond to stress. So while people here are wondering how, what's the best way to deal with stress, please realize it will be different for each one of us based on our individual resources, based on uh, the, the, the temperament that we have, the social support that we have around us, what has worked for us in the past, what has not worked for us in the past. So, at least dealing with stress is one thing you should not be comparing yourself or your kids or someone with someone else because it's different for everyone. In my work, I found that stress became a gateway to mental health problems in general. And, you know, nurses and, and young uh, people I spoke to use stress uh, to talk about mental health problems. When we delved into it, of course, there, there were, you know, depression had a different pathway anxiety or other kind of traumas but stress became an opening point to that so I think that opportunity is important that we all understand stress and live through it the second thing that um, I want to talk about is that conditions of extreme adversity and poverty and adverse social determinants require a reflection on stress that you know I'd be interested in a conversation, a next conversation on this with Dr. Lupian and others on how do we get the best out of what these experiences of extreme deprivation, are, you know, how deep they make us, but also how um, how empty we can feel because of we so, like HIV, for example, you know that that the kind of stress people go through when they don't have food, they have to be on medications and all of that. I mean, that's been so widely studied. Those will be also domains to look at, but uh, what a fantastic uh, discussion. Um, and so thanks for that. Thank you. Thank you, Manasi. Those are insightful points that you're making. The other area that we didn't get a chance to delve into is this issue of, um, uh, of transgenerational transmission of trauma and stress. Like how, how does a stress mother, stressed mother transmit that information to her offspring and how does it how many generations does it last and how, how does it influence those processes downstream is also quite important because sometimes when we are challenged with stressors and, and we're very stressed, uh, we don't realize the impact it's having on, on our families and our, especially our kids and how, that is going, how they're going to embody some of those reactions and how they too then are going 
possibly going to transfer it on to the next generation. So this is this construct between the, the relationship between genes, epigenetics, and, um, and, uh, and, and transmission of information to the next generation. That's, that's also quite critically uh, interesting and important for us to address because in the geographies that we serve, um, very often because of the severe trauma, um, the mothers may have things like postpartum depression or uh, inability to interact with the children more fully. And so what impact is that having uh, not only now, but in the future? So that's that would be another fun topic for us to kind of delve into going forward, uh, but not for today. Um, really, maybe just a last note from our end in terms of um, uh, the strategies, the nuts that you were talking about, Dr. Lupia, and one of our, the most uh, famous uh, marathoner from Kenya, um, Eliud Kipchoge, he says when he's running, he starts smiling when his body is trying to give in, and that changes his chemistry and everything. And I think he's won all last marathons that he's um, uh, participated in. And so there's definitely something to do with definition and how we trick our brains. There are ways we can trick our brains um, to rethink what stress is and how we can handle and cope with stress. Um, we have loads of questions in the Q&A. Um, we're supposed to get into that, but maybe just one question for us as we close the session. Um, can you measure a person's baseline stress level and what is the relationship between stress levels and performance? Especially because we have many students here, um, a lot of um, staff and faculty from AKU and other places. Uh, I think these two questions will probably be the best for this panel to answer, and then uh, we'll start uh, closing up the session. Uh, panel, please go ahead. Maybe Dr. Lupien, we can start with you. It's very difficult. I have many, many people calling me saying, okay, I would like my stress hormones to be measured in my saliva. I'm going to spit somewhere and send it to you when you can analyze it. It's not that simple, but we can analyze it in the lab, but we always have a control group compared to uh, the Zen, compared to the stress, etc. The problem we have in science at this point is we don't have norms. And when you go to see the doctor and says that the doctor says you have high cholesterol levels is because they have norms that they can use to compare yourself to. And we don't have that yet because of cultural differences as well, you know? So now let me tell you something. If you go on the web, you can find anything in the US. So you have companies in the US who now say that they can measure your stress uh, hormone levels. Uh, you spit in some things and it back to them, they will measure it. But the thing is that your level of stress hormones will be compared to American norms. Not sure this is what can provide something interesting. So uh, it is not going to work that much. The second problem we have in having you know stress level and as it was said before you're absolutely right stress equals individual differences so this is it look. so the problem the second problem we have with you know figuring out your stress level is that different people have different stress resistance this is very clear so at one end of the continuum you have people who have a very low stress resistance so they don't need a lot of stress before activating themselves you know and at the other end of the continuum, you have people who have a very high stress resistance level. For example, there are people in my lab that I may try to stress with every techniques that the ethic committees allow me to use. I cannot stress them. And as I always say as a joke, these must be the same people, you know, we've been waiting for for 30 minutes in the airplane before going off because they've put their luggage in the plane and they're not there yet. And they come in last minute, the procrastinator. So they have high stress resistance. So given this inverted U-shaped function that we were talking about, that the stress resistance is not the same depending on people. So someone who has a low stress resistance, the inverted U-shape looks like fit, fit. you don't need a lot of stress before getting to your point of resistance. Well, something, someone who has a high stress resistance, the inverted U-shaped curve looks like de -de -de -de, then resistance then goes down. So we're going to need a couple of decades of good research before being able to tell people their stress levels. So um, it looks like then uh, we, we just because of time, we won't be able to answer any more questions. Um, I'll just and, and treat all the uh, participants for this session uh, to scan this QR code. And then uh, when you have free time, please 
give us feedback so that we can be able to fashion and uh, respond to some of the, the needs in terms of webinar needs um, and uh, engagement needs from the Brain and Mind Institute. So um, uh, please scan this code so that you can give us feedback. It only takes two minutes. Um, with regards to uh, future BMI engagements, uh, coming up soon between the month of uh, May, May 9th to the 14th, we'll be promoting brain awareness and having an engagement around neural developmental disorders. Um, you're all invited. We'll be sharing a lot of this information on our socials. So please look out for that. Um, and then um, the, uh, another engagement we'll be having in May um, is another webinar on community engaged health. Is it an achievable utopia or is it possible? Um, um, on May 12th, uh, with the keynote speaker being uh, David S. Bach. Um, with that, I hand over to uh, Zoo uh, to close the session. Thank you. Thank you, Candy. So first of all, again, thank you very much, Dr. Lupien. I think uh, it was a fabulous, fabulous presentation, really very informative. And you're touching upon a very important topic. And I and we look forward to working with you in terms of our next steps forward. We're also looking forward to your book. Uh, that'll be fun to read. But we are very appreciative of the time that you made to talk to our, uh, our audience. Um, I also wanted to say a big thank you to our panelists who have taken a lot of time and made some very important contributions. So thank you all. But last but not least, I wanted to thank the participants, the audience, um, we are here just because of you. So thank you for participating. Uh, sorry we couldn't get to all the questions. You were quite all excited. I, the, the, the questions were just rolling and rolling. Um, but at one point in time, we will figure a better way to kind of handle the, the question part. But we have really reached the, the ceiling end of our time allocation. So with that, I wanted to thank you all and, and especially thank you, uh, Candy and, uh, and Gloria and, and Cheru in helping organize this webinar. They've done a fabulous job and very seamless, good of teamwork. So thank you all. So with that, I wanna say, have a good day and uh, thank you very much for participation.